Okay, so it's always a, a question of how we present this information to you. Do we do the practical and then try and explain the theory or do we go in the opposite order? Now obviously today I've spent a lot of time talking through those ideas. I'm conscious of the fact that until you see an example it probably is very fuzzy. Hopefully some of the words that I was saying sound a little bit familiar, kind of sound logical. Now we get the chance to put it into practice and work through a problem. And once again, we've got all the information in the slides, but I want to make sure that through the document camera, we really just go through and remind ourselves of that theory at the same time as looking at the practical. Now, the actual formal hypothesis test, starting with writing down a null and an alternative, can be described using six steps. Some textbooks vary how many steps there are a little bit. And as I said, it's a very formal procedure. There are certain things you have to do leading down to that final conclusion, which will be written with respect to the null as well as the alternative. So we have to do all these things. I like to show you that it does turn into six steps because that's how most textbooks present it. But the reality is as long as you follow that logical path and include all the components that we need to, I really don't mind whether you call things step one, step two, step three. That doesn't matter. It must have a logical flow and everything must be in there. But I still include this in the slides because I think it's a nice reference. So I'm not going to just read it out to you. We're going to go through those steps as we go through the example, but you've got that there to refer to. Now, we're going to start with a hypothesis test for the mean, and we're going to assume sigma is known. And we know from what we did with confidence intervals last week, that means that our sampling distribution is normal and it's going to therefore involve using Z to work out different areas on our distribution. We will then have a look at how we once again adjust if sigma is unknown and just like what we did with confidence intervals, that will involve using a T distribution. But once you've got the hang of this whole, confident, uh, the whole hypothesis testing procedure and you can see how it links to confidence intervals from last week, it really becomes a very mechanical process of what's the specific formula, what are my numbers, plug it in, go through the steps, you're all done. So we'll spend longer on this first example, really trying to link it to all those theory ideas that we've just talked through and then we'll go through some of the variations. Okay, now please also note that these slides that we've got for our first example, they're not written in terms of, say, a tutorial or an exam question. They kind of give you some information as you go. There are certain things I have to tell you in an exam question. You need to be given all the information you need for the problem. But pretty much we're going to be testing uh, the assumption that the true mean number of TV sets in US homes is equal to three. We are going to assume that we have population standard deviation sigma. And I am going to give you some sample information, sample size and sample mean, but that comes a little bit further down. So let's have a look at this. It's in the notes, but just a bit slow, but we'll go through it on the document camera. Okay, so we're going to do a hypothesis test on the mean. We're testing whether the mean number of TV sets is equal to three or not equal to three. Now equals will be the null, not equals will be the alternative. I must set up the null and the alternative at the start of my hypothesis test. Now what other bits of information do you need to be given? Well, I need to tell you the level of significance. I can use it, those words or I can just tell you alpha. And that represents the, the total size of the reject region. 
So it could be split into two if it's a two-tailed test. But alpha is the total reject region size. So if alpha is 5%, as it is in this example that we're about to do, it's saying we're going to reject the null hypothesis if our sample mean is in the least likely 5% to occur based on assuming the null is true. So it has to be one of the 5% least likely to occur to be unlikely enough for us to reject the null. Now, you have to have some sample information, sample size of 100 here and a sample mean of 2.84. So the sample average number of TV sets was 2.84. Another little bit of information in terms of exams, I would not give you raw data. In the mid-exam, I gave you raw data and asked you to work out things like mean and standard deviation. In the second half, I'm going to assume you know how to do that, and so I would give you any sample statistics that you need, such as sample mean. And we're going to assume sigma is known in this problem, and in fact we've been told that it's 0.8. Now, the fact that sigma is known tells me that I'm going to be using Z. A little bit later we'll see that we have to use T if sigma is unknown. Okay, now I'm going to do a little bit more writing here than you would necessarily do for a tut or an exam question, but for this first one I want us to clearly work through all those ideas that we've been talking about. Now, when we do a hypothesis test we assume that the null is true. What are the implications here? If we assume the null is true, we are assuming that mu is equal to 3. Now, what is so special about assuming that the population mean is 3? Well, remember, if I know the population x, I know the sampling distribution x bar. So the idea is that that assumption allows me to say that the sampling distribution would also have a mean of 3. So we'll put a little note in. If the null is true, then the mean of our sampling distribution is also 3. Okay, so that's the information that I have access to. Now, in terms of my test, equals, not equals. Pretty much, if my sample mean is a long way below 3 or if my sample mean is a long way above 3, that would make me think that the true mean isn't 3. Equals, not equals, there's no direction specified. So this is going to be a two-tail test. And the idea is that when I take my sample, and look at where it comes from in my sampling distribution to decide if that sample was likely or unlikely based on the assumption that the null was true, well, I want to have a look at where it falls in terms of this sampling distribution. And so what I'm going to do is, if it's sufficiently below 3 or sufficiently above 3, in those areas, the tail areas, which are those where it's least likely to occur, if the mean of that sampling distribution is 3, well then values in these two tails are the least likely to occur. I'm going to set those up such that they are my reject regions. And it's plural here because it's two tail. So we're saying that we're going to reject the null if our sample mean is in the least likely 5% to occur. That 5% is spread out over these two tails. So alpha over 2, they're each 2.5% two in size, which is just 0 0.025 as a decimal. 
And of course, if our sample mean was in the bigger region, such that this is where the 95% most likely sample means would occur, well, if we get one that's in there, we would not reject. Okay, so we take a sample and we get a sample mean of 2.84. Where is that in terms of my diagram? Is that in the area where we don't reject the null because it's close enough to 3 that we can just attribute the difference to sampling variation? Or is it far enough away from 3 that we say it's in the least likely 5% to occur if the null had been true and we say therefore we're going to reject the null? How do we know where this number fits in? Well, we really need to know these boundary points. But in terms of coming up with those boundary points, we can't really do anything with that particular normal distribution because it has a mean of 3 and its standard deviation will be 0.8 divided by the square root of 100. But what we can do is convert it to Z to solve. And that's going to involve not just converting the diagram, so in terms of Z, if in the middle is 95% and I've got these two tails of 2.5% each, such that I've got my two reject areas, It's actually not very hard to use our inverse table to come up with those boundaries, 1.96, negative 1.96, and they're referred to as critical values, just like when we did our confidence intervals. Critical values in that they mark that boundary point. Okay, so now I know those values for the reject regions in terms of Z, what I could do, I could take the Z 1.96 and I could translate it back to its equivalent X bar value and it would be something more than 3 on that side, something less than 3 on that side. So I could do that and translate back to that diagram, I'd have to do 2. Or I could just say, well, wherever X was in this diagram, wherever that X bar sample mean was in my sampling distribution, it has an equivalent position in the Z. So I can translate it to Z as well using the same formula that we saw last week, just our customised Z score. So our sample mean is 2.8. To turn it into a Z value, you minus the mean, divide by the standard deviation of that distribution. And that gives us a Z score of negative 2. So it's saying wherever 2.84 was in terms of this sampling distribution X bar, negative 2, our equivalent Z value, maps onto this Z diagram. So in fact, where is that? That value is inside the lower reject region. Now that value we call a test statistic because it's our sample mean turned into a z-score such that we can use it on this Z diagram, which we call a decision diagram, because we've marked on the reject region or regions. It's all in terms of Z. You convert your sample mean to that test statistic, which just turns it into a Z value 2, and then you can have a look at that diagram and come up with your decision. And of course, because our test statistic is in that reject region, doesn't matter which one it's in, our conclusion is to reject the null. So we must initially say whether we reject or not reject the null. 
But then we state it in terms of the alternative. There is sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean number of TV sets is not 3 at alpha 5%. So you must include what level you were testing at because possibly if you had run say a 1% test, our reject regions would have been half a percent each in size, they would have been further into those tails and negative to our test statistic would have fact not been in a rejection region. So at a different level of significance your result can change. So we're saying here that 2.84 as our sample mean is in fact far enough away from 3 that it's in the 5% least likely to occur had the null hypothesis really been true. So that's the idea of a hypothesis test. Now, although you don't necessarily draw your population distribution X and write all this information on it, I just wanted you to see that as we work through the problem, you would certainly draw your decision diagram so that you can set up your rejection regions. You would convert your sample statistic to the Z value so that you've got that test statistic to compare to the decision diagram and therefore come up with your conclusion. And you must write the conclusion in two parts. Firstly, with respect to the null and then secondly, with respect to the alternative including the level of significance that you've used for that particular test. Now there is a lot of work there and it's taking into account all those ideas and I suspect that you might need to work through these types of problems, read through the notes a few times to really appreciate that idea of, you know, we reject if the sample is one of those that's at a certain level the least likely to occur. But if you keep sort of persevering, in the end I think you come to appreciate that this is quite a nice technique. Still using all that theory from topic 7, but it's allowing us to take a very practical approach to real life issues involving populations. Okay, so that is how you do a, a hypothesis test. Now we've got lots of slides where I lead you through it, not with quite the same little extra notes that we write on the document camera and that's why I wanted to go through it with you. You must get the test statistic, turning your sample statistic into a Z value. Draw your decision diagram, the slide's got a little bit, uh, a little bit altered but we've got the, the correct version on the document camera anyway. Set up that decision diagram, compare your test statistic to the decision diagram and then come up with your conclusion. So that's what we need to do to do a hypothesis test. Okay, now there is a slightly different way that we could approach this whole process. And I want to show it to you because although the technique we've just been through is the more intuitive, there are some advantages to this alternative technique and it's often the one that if you're reading a report and there's a little footnote talking about a hypothesis test, it will usually make reference to this form of the calculation. So again, it's in the slides, but let's work through it. on the document camera. Okay, we took a sample and our sample mean was 2.84. We converted it into a test statistic which was just turning it into an equivalent Z value. We got negative 2. We then compared that to our decision diagram to see if it was in a reject region or in the do not reject region. 
The way we can alter our approach is to not have a decision diagram but to calculate the test statistic and then say, well, what are the odds of getting that test statistic or something more extreme? So that translates into saying, what are the odds of getting a Z value less than negative 2? Now, we can do that. We can, in fact, just look that straight off our, up off our tables. It's a less than, you've got your Z tables, 0 0.0228. Now, in terms of the diagram, it's telling you the area below negative 2 on our Z diagram. Now, just keep in mind that when you do a two-tailed test, getting a test statistic of negative 2 is actually the same as getting a test statistic of positive 2. It didn't matter whether it was negative 2 or positive 2, you would have rejected because it was a two-tailed test. So what we do is we say, let's include the area above 2 as well. Now that's not a problem because they're in fact both the same size because of the symmetry. And we're going to call that total area a p-value. Now you only need to work out the one probability and because it's symmetrical you multiply it by 2. So the p-value in this case is 0 0.0456, just under 5%. Why is that important? Well, what you can do is you can compare that p-value to your level of significance alpha. We were doing a 5% test. Now, we rejected because our test statistic was inside the reject region. It will always be inside the reject region if your p-value is less than alpha because that's saying your test statistic fits inside the reject region. So we in fact don't need to draw a decision diagram if we calculate a p-value. If we just get the test statistic, turn it into a p-value, we can simply say if the p-value is less than alpha, that's equivalent to the test statistic fitting inside the reject region, so we would reject the null. But of course, if the p-value is greater than alpha, it's saying our test statistic is going to sit in the do not reject region. And so that's our conclusion. Now the good thing about this technique and not drawing the decision diagram, there was no reference up here to alpha. I didn't have to say at this point whether it was a 5% test, a 1% test, a 10% test. We just looked at the sample mean, turned it into a test statistic, worked out the odds of getting that test statistic or something more extreme, then we compared to alpha. And I said, well here, that is less than 5%, so it's inside the reject region, we reject the null. But let's say I change to a 1% test. When I've got the p-value, I don't need to redraw my decision diagram, I just compare that p-value to the different value of alpha. And so if my alpha was 1%, well clearly this p-value would be inside the do not reject region, so I would not reject the null. So it's very easy when you've got the p-value to compare different values of alpha. It also is telling you exactly how unlikely that sample mean was. It's saying that it was in the 4.56% least likely to occur. So it's not a question of whether your sample mean was, you know, really close to 3 or further away, whether it was in, you know, um, the sort of 90% most likely to occur, you've actually quantified its position in that sampling distribution. And so that information is very useful in itself. You can use it to get the conclusion, but quite often reports will quote a p-value in a footnote or in an appendix. So
so that you not only get the conclusion in the report, but you can see just where the sample statistic fitted in to that conclusion. Now, hypothesis testing, the sort of decision diagram technique is probably the easiest to work through when you're learning. The p-value has its value in allowing easy comparison to different alphas and that the result gives you that extra little bit of information. But while I do expect you to know what a p-value is, and if I ask you to calculate p-value in an exam, you need to be able to do that. But if I just ask you a hypothesis testing question, it would be up to you whether you use the decision diagram or the p-value technique. So you have to learn about it, but for most general hypothesis testing questions, you get a choice. I would have to specifically say, use the p-value. If I don't, it's up to you.